Hello everybody, welcome to Unit 3 Biology Area Study 2. Today we are going to be focusing on photosynthesis. So we're going to be looking at the two um, stages of photosynthesis. We'll be looking at the role of rubisco and we'll be looking at what affects the rate of photosynthesis as well. So photosynthesis we know is the way that plants are able to produce glucose and they can use that glucose in cellular respiration okay so plants algae some protists and some bacteria they all use sunlight to make these um sugars and the process that they're using that is the process that we call photosynthesis so these organisms we call them phot photoautotrophic um, and they produces um, and it's the process in which the light energy captured from the sun is basically being transformed into chemical energy in the form of glucose. Um, it's most efficient in wavelengths of red and blue as well. So there are two major stages that occur. That is the light dependent and then the light independent stage. So the light independent stage can also be referred to as the Kelvin cycle. We'll start off and we'll look at the light dependent stage. So in terms of the chloroplast where this is occurring, this is happening in the grana of the chloroplast and it's the first stage of photosynthesis. So it takes place in that thylakoid membrane called the grana and that's where basically light energy is being trapped and converted into chemical energy in the form of ATP and also NADPH and that's going to be used in the light independent stage later on. But the big thing that's happening is water is being split and oxygen gas is being produced. Electrons are being transferred to NADPH and ATP is produced. So I like to use this diagram here. Arrow going in are our inputs, so light and water, and then our outputs of oxygen, ATP and NADPH, which is then going to be involved in our light independent reaction. So light independent is happening in like the liquidy bit, the stroma of the chloroplast. And the Kelvin cycle is a little bit more complex. There are a series of reactions that are occurring involving different inputs and outputs to convert carbon dioxide into um, glucose. So our input of our light independent stage is definitely carbon dioxide and our output is going to be our glucose. And there's three major stages that are involved in this process called carbon fixation, reduction, and regeneration of rubisco, which we're going to talk about in a moment. But as long as ATP and NADPH are continuously supplied by the light-dependent reaction, um, the Kelvin cycle will continue. Okay, and we can see those cycling of coenzymes happening with NADPH and ATP, and NADP plus and ADP plus as well. Alrighty, rubisco. So this is new to this year's study design, the involvement of rubisco, and it's basically a key enzyme that's involved in the independent stage. So its action sometimes varies. Um, it binds to carbon dioxide and it facilitates further reactions in this process, okay? Um, other times it can also bind to oxygen and initiates a wasteful process, which we call photorespiration. So rubisco is really responsible for the initial changes to carbon dioxide that are happening at the beginning of the Kelvin cycle. So what happens is rubisco is using some carbon dioxide molecules and a five carbon molecule called RUBP, okay, RUBP, to produce six three carbon molecules. Okay, that's what we're calling our three PGA. The six three PGA that were formed here are then converted into our ATP and our NADPH from the light uh, from the light dependent reaction, and they're making our three carbon molecules, six of them, and we call that G3P. So you may have seen um, some of these before, but in other words, our three PGA molecules are changed into six um, G3P molecules, and they they all contain three carbon atoms. So one of those G3P molecules is then going to leave the cycle and that's going to undergo further reactions that are going to create our glucose. Um, and then the remaining five G3P, they're what's recycled to help with ATP to regenerate more of that RUBP, okay, that we had at the start of the cycle. And the cycle will then continue over and over again. So overall, each cycle is going to um, turn twice to produce one glucose molecule, okay, um, as well. So we can see that summarized over here where you can see our carbon fixation, our reduction and our regeneration process. I encourage you to pause the video and just have a look at what our inputs and outputs 
R um, of each of those as well. Moving on to basically our different types of photosynthesis. So you might recall in the study design dot points, we need to know the role of rubisco, which we just spoke about, but the adaptations of C3, C4 and CAM plants to manage uh, to maximise the efficiency of photosynthesis. So this table over here from Ed Rollo actually summarises this quite nicely. Um, for each of the different types of photosynthesis, we can see some crucial information. So for C3, um, plants there's no limits on photorespiration um, there is no separation of initial carbon dioxide fixation um, the stomata open during the day advantages it doesn't consume extra energy disadvantage it is susceptible to photorespiration initiation it's best adapted to moderate or cool and wet environments some examples would be re oh, reese <laughs> wheat and rice and all kinds of trees c4 plants they um, do limit photorespiration the separation of initial carbon dioxide fixation is between cells okay the stomata open again during the day advantages is minimized photorespiration disadvantage more energy consumption and it's best adapted to hot sunny habitats um, so examples of some of those plants would be corn sugarcane and switchgrass and then we've got our cam plants so cam um, photosynthesis is limiting photorespiration in this case the separation of the initial carbon dioxide is between night and day so it can happen over time stomata here open at night um, the advantage of that is it's minimizing the photorespiration and reduces water loss but disadvantage again is that consumption of extra energy Best adapted to very hot, dry habitats, so things like cactus and pineapples and orchids for that one. And then factors that can affect the rate of photosynthesis. So we know that there are a few factors that can affect the rate of photosynthesis occurring, so the production of glucose, um, and that is light intensity. Okay, so increasing the light is going to increase basically the rate of photosynthesis until a plateau is going to be reached. Temperature will basically increase the rate when below the optimal, but then after the optimal, the rate is going to decline. Um, with pH, it increases it below the optimal, okay, and then decreases um, above the optimal as well. In terms of carbon dioxide concentration, it increases until a plateau is reached. And then we've got water. So typically in excess in a plant, it's still an input, but we can say that increasing it will increase photosynthesis. Um, and enzyme inhibition, there's greater inhibitors that are decreasing the rate of photosynthesis. So we need to know the impact that this will have. Um, when we increase each of these factors and what's going to happen if we decrease. So decrease would tend to be the opposite. Um, and then there's some differences depending on whether it's a C3, C4 and CAM plants. So the major limiting factors, okay, um, basically if it's in short supply, it will restrict the rate of photosynthesis. So the things that are really important are the intensity of radiant light, temperature and the concentration of carbon dioxide that can all have an impact. If you have any questions regarding this, please leave a comment below. There is also um, a video on photosynthesis if you look at some videos from the previous study design that might help you as well. All right, have a good day. Thank you. Bye.